the Asia Pacific region and was an effective vehicle upon which people who want to serve in government would uh, uh, resort to in order to win the people's confidence. But martial law bastardized the political party system. We used to have a two-party system before martial law. And uh, martial law would not tolerate any dissent, and therefore the political party system was, uh, in effect, abolished. And the political party system never recovered from that. In fact, uh, President Cory Aquino never belonged to a political party during her entire stint as President of the Republic. By the way, it's the birthday of President Cory today. today. And uh, it is good that we're hearing these political party system bills on this occasion. So, Madam Chair, we have uh, filed this act strengthening the political party system in our country in the hope that we can have the basic framework, as you have mentioned, in order that we can strengthen our political party system here and make it an effective tool for people's participation in governance as it should be if or if we have to have a working democracy. Um, we, uh, uh, you have briefly outlined the uh, uh, principal features of the bill that we have uh, submitted for your con for the consideration of the Senate through your committee, and we do hope to finally see a, 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 a passage, a success in, in our attempt to put a framework, a good framework for the revival of a stronger political party system in our country. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Gillon. As I mentioned earlier, there have been previous bills already on the same subject matter filed in previous Congresses reaching various levels. And uh, as a matter of fact, for in, in, during the uh, 13th Congress and 15th Congress, the bills reach the committee report stage, meaning there have been consolidated substitute bills uh, submitted in a committee report and taken up in plenary. But uh, for some reason, maybe uh, for lack of material time because of certain uh, debates on the matter, this was uh, not enacted. So this time around, the chair feels determined to really push this. It's about time because it's long overdue. Now what we're going to do in the interest of uh, uh, time and also so we can have a focused discussion, and I assume also that some of the resource persons today have submitted already their respective written position papers, and, uh, and I would assume also that the resource uh, uh, persons have uh, went over or perused, at least perused over the three subject measures. I would just be asking from the resource persons uh, if they have any reservations, concerns, differing views or opinions on the features of these three bills, the main highlights, which I mentioned earlier. The anti number one, anti-political turncoatism, particularly the criminalization thereof, punishing, punishing or providing penalty for uh, turncoatism. Number two, the uh, campaign financing of uh, national political parties. And number three, state subsidy. This, I think, are the main features, common major features of these three bills. And this is where the chair is interested, whether any of 
the uh, resource persons present have reservations or different views. May we acknowledge at this point the presence of Attorney Charlie Ho, representing PDP Laban. We also recognize we also recognize the presence of a commissioner uh, Bing Guanzon. Good morning. So may we first hear from the good chair, Chair Andy Bautista of the Comelec. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Sesnet, President Pro Temp. On behalf of Commissioner Guanson and the Commission on Elections, we would like to thank the committee for inviting us to participate in today's committee hearing and to provide our comments and observations regarding the three bills pending. Um, we do have some preliminary comments on the bills, but as the chair had pointed out, I think she wanted to focus on three points. So we will just submit the, the other comments in a separate position paper. On the three points, and it's good that we also have uh, Commissioner Guanson here because she might have her own comments regarding the matter. In respect of turncoat this, uh, my personal stand is that it should be punished, but I do not think it can be criminally punished because there will be issues, well, constitutional issues uh, that will also be involved such as a person's right to free expression and association. However, I don't think uh, Congress is prevented from providing a penalty, an, ad an administrative penalty, in case a person uh, changes political parties and provided that, as I said, there are um, clear guidelines on what the, the um, the act that is being punished, but I would think that it is better not to criminally punish, but to just provide an administrative penalty. So as part of the um, administrative penalty, you have no objection in respect to the proposal to disqualify the turncoat from running for election in the next election? Yes, Madam Chair, I think that the Congress is empowered to do that, that uh, you can legislate a law that would provide for that and in fact also provide for some form of uh, a fine in case uh, there is a violator of such provision. Number two, in respect of campaign finance, I think that also we at Comelec have been trying to uh, um, push for campaign finance reform and as we know, one of the big issues is the campaign spending limits, which we believe are already outdated. That it is high time that Congress review the limits provided by law and that uh, they be increased so as to be more realistic uh, in respect of modern uh, costs of waging a campaign. What about, what about the proposed limits to only a maximum of one million for a contributor to the funds of uh, a political party. That's, that's one of the uh, proposed provisions in, in I, th I think, two of the three measures. Well, personally, Madam Chair, I may think that one million again may not be realistic. Perhaps we should uh, increase it uh, to make it more realistic because also, as you know, what, for example, they've done in the United States is that they did try to provide caps, but what people would do in order to circumvent the cap is that they would just distribute the, the funds to, say, relatives and friends. To me, again, so that we can be just, tr you know, more transparent in the way uh, campaigns are being financed, I think we should have a reasonable limit so that we know who are the main campaign contributors of a particular candidate. So I just want to make it clear that uh, in your opinion the proposed cap of one million per contributor is not reasonable. I think given current conditions you would opt for a higher a cap. higher cap. But do you agree that there's got to be a cap? There has it to be a cap be as well. Unlimited. That's correct. And the other thing we should look at, Madam Chair, is perhaps because right now corporations are not 
allowed to provide campaign contributions. Yes. And perhaps the committee might, because again, uh, as to why they're not allowed, you could make an argument against both sides. What is the position of the chair, personal or otherwise? Personal to me, I think uh, it should be allowed. Uh, personal position. And with caps. And with caps. Everything right. should have caps. And as I said, the, the whole concept is we want to be transparent. We want to make sure that we're able to really monitor who are the contributors. You know, campaign contribution, again, in, in, a, in the United States is an important free expression, free speech, uh, you know, a, has that strong component in which case, um, you know, it has constitutional underpinnings. But to me, the real key is regulation and being able to monitor such expenses. Now, talking about campaign contributions, I was just reminded, and I think I have a letter to the good chair on, on that, although I do not wish to dwell on that lengthily at this point, but I just want to ask about it. I, 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 uh, I would, uh, pref I would uh, request a, a brief response on this. Um, this idea about campaign fundraiser, it has come to my attention that certain candidates before, uh, during the last elections, have actually reported the contributions from fundraisers or a fundraiser. So it presupposes that this fundraiser or fundraisers would just get contributions from other individual donors or contributors, but without actually reporting the names of the persons who actually contributed in the course of the fundraising because it was the fundraiser who, dis who was disclosed. Is, is that scenario uh, within the uh, knowledge of uh, the Comelec? I have not received your letter, but uh, we will uh, respond accordingly when we do get it. Mm -hmm. I am not, uh, well, this is a new, um, I guess, concept, a fundraiser, but it is not uh, being given to a particular candidate, but it's like, you know, there's a third party that is being got, given money, and that this third party now will be the one who will be contributing to the candidate, is that? Yes, it's the fundraiser who was disclosed by the candidate in his source. But since it's a fundraiser, that means he collected from other persons, <coughs> not disclosing the names of the contributors. Anyway, as I said, I'm not going to... We will have to uh, take a look at that. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. Madam Chair, just on the point of the corporations uh, being not allowed yes. to contribute. Firstly, I do not understand the rationale uh, on this. But second, just, just, just to flag, we, are, we have sponsored on the floor of the Senate the amendments to the corporation code. One of those which we have not touched is section 36, paragraph 9 of the Corporation Code, which says that no corporation, domestic or foreign, shall give donations in aid of a political party or candidate or for purposes of partisan political activity. That's what the present Corporation Code provides. We would like to seek guidance from this committee how we ha will handle this because it's already we already sponsored it. We expect to pass it within the next uh, two months. And therefore, we would like to know whether we would like to get guidance from your committee how we should handle this particular provision in the corporation code. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. In other words, we need to synchronize. So if, if we are to consider changing the, the law now in terms of the prohibition uh, for uh, corporations in an election law, then there must be a corresponding amendment in the corporation code. Now, if we have to do it, we have to do it for both. So what, what is the view of the good chair? Well, if you're already going to come up with a law, I think it, this would be a good opportunity to also already insert that provision, especially if we will come up with, a, with, with amendments to the campaign finance provisions. Mm -hmm. All right. On the state subsidy? 
State subsidy, um, again, my personal position is that I think it works if, though, you have, number one, a political party system that, that uh, is strong, that really there are identified political parties that will be able to avail uh, of such subsidy. I think that is where there will be a gray area that once there is government money that is going to be given to political parties, I'm sure that there will be a lot of political parties that will come out of the woodwork, which will try to get this this money. You know. So that's where, the, you know, if ever we do this, we have to think that, uh, you know, of which political parties should be provided with such subsidy, because you just don't want any ad hoc party to be given state money. Secondly, of course, from a question of priorities, we know that the country, is, well, we still have problems uh, in respect of pro you know, poverty and uh, peace and order, etc. Query as to whether, again, uh, public money should be used in order to subsidize uh, political parties at this stage in our, I guess, uh, political development. So, but um, I know that this is being done in other countries, but I note that these countries that do provide state subsidies are usually more developed countries. The take of the chair is that it is precisely to strengthen political parties that we need to give subsidy. And the proposed measures actually provide for the criteria, the general criteria for, uh, for entitlement to subsidy. Not only the sharing, the percentages, but also the criteria. So not all political parties may be entitled to a share from the state, from the state subsidy, because it's got to, it's got to, the, the political parties must meet the general criteria that will be provided in, in, in the law. There, Madam Chair, I think, you know, in terms of general criteria, and if I may liken this situation to that of the party list system, wherein I think, again, that law was uh, what, paved with good intentions in the sense that really we wanted to make sure that the, well, Kongneri is here, that the underrepresented and the marginalized are given an opportunity to participate meaningfully in the political process. And yet you could see that when the law was being implemented, there were various groups that were able to circumvent the, the noble intention of the law. And therefore, now, while well, we have a party list system that is currently existing, inquiry as to whether it is, um, I'd say, um, if it is really in consonance with what the framers of the law originally envisioned. No. So same thing here. I think that the key is to make sure that the provisions are tightly uh, crafted so that it will not be abused by, well, pseudo-political parties or parties that just want to get government money in order that uh, they can, um, well, use them for their uh, own uh, agenda. Thank you. Um, we recognize the presence of former Commissioner Lara Zabal. You are representing? Um, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, uh, Attorney uh, Lara Zabal, Commissioner Lara Zabal is General Counsel of NPC. Of NPC. Welcome. Okay. So you want to say something, Commissioner Guanzon? I like, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I like Senate Bill 226 on um, state subsidies. That's a drill on. Yes, but uh, with the permission of Senator Drillon, uh, state subsidy fund uh, will have more impact for women candidates if we follow some models in other countries where they have state subsidies for political parties that field a certain percentage of women candidates in the list. Say, for example, if we add it to the criteria that a political party that fields at least 40% of candidates who are women mm -hmm. will get a certain amount or percentage from the subsidy fund. 
will encourage a lot of political parties to field women candidates and achieve gender equality in the end. And we thank you for championing, as always, gender equality. Thank you, Chair. Go ahead. The purpose of a state subsidy fund in other countries is to equalize opportunities and access to elections. It is precisely to fund poor parties and poor candidates, which is the reason why government subsidizes their participation in elections. We all know that the reason why women cannot have equal access to elections is because elections are very expensive in this country. And our laws and rules are antiquated or nebulous. I like this Senate bill because it, in tries, it wants to increase the, the expense limit of the candidate per voter because what we have now is impossible. I have personally uh, been a candidate, uh, I was a mayor, and I have uh, observed a lot of uh, elections in the past before I was commissioner. And I think that 95% of the candidates lie in their statement of expenses and, uh, and contributions and expenses. Uh, I, no, it's just a personal it's opinion. Uh, uh, it's just a figure of speech. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Durant, of course, this is a figure of speech. That, that they have to lie. Because it's impossible. What do you expect people to do if we prosecute them when they exceed the, the limit? Naturally, they have to lie. But government chair has no way, and the COMELEC has no way of monitoring it anyway. So we have to rely on their sense of honesty and goodness when they state this in their source. So perhaps the Senate bill of Senator Dulon can go farther in uh, ensuring that there's a law for the COMELEC <laughs> to, to, to rely on so that we can monitor expenditure of campaign funds aside from just the sauce. For now, I have no specific idea, but I will think about it and will write the chair immediately. Uh, as to performance and track record, uh, again, if we make performance and track record a criteria for qualifying for a state subsidy fund, a new party, for example, of women, will be unable to get a subsidy because we will not have performance and track record. And yet, the problem of gender inequality in elections is serious in this country. Uh, of course, now we have about 30% congresswomen in the House of Reps, but the general average share in the country is still less than 20%, including the barangay elections. The Comelec Gender and Development Executive Committee is going around the country uh, for advocating for gender equality in elections in the local governments. And the, the data is the same. Even down to the barangay level, it is less. To, women occupy only less than 20% of the seats, uh, even in the barangay level, on the average in the national statistics. So I would like uh, to suggest <laughs> <laughs> with the indulgence of Senator Trilan. Please that proceed. the performance and track record of the party should have some exceptions uh, to have room for uh, gender equality. If, uh, we, if, if there is a, a synchron, if there's another provision in the bill that, that gives uh, women, uh, parties, political parties with a, um, a certain percentage of women candidates in their list, uh, will be able to avail of so much uh, from the state subsidy fund. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We will, uh, the, the committee through the TWG will uh, revisit the criterion on the uh, track record to try to come up with some uh, nuancing there about, you know, because you have a point there, what if it's a new party, but a serious party with serious uh, advocacies and platform. So we can, we can uh, uh, look into that. Thank you. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we will, we will invite you.
at the TWG level. Take note, Secretariat. Representative Agabao, Thank you on, very on much. the three issues that uh, I, I, I was seeking. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> for the record, Madam Chair, I'm not a sitting congressman anymore. I was uh, term limited. And so my presence here is in my capacity as president of uh, NPC. And uh, my party uh, wishes to extend its thanks to this committee for inviting us here. We have not uh, furnished a copy of our position paper, uh, Madam Chairman, because we just got the invitation about two days ago. But we would be preparing a written uh, submission. But uh, I ask the consent of this committee to just make a very, very brief uh, statement. Um, our party could not agree more, uh, Your Honors, about the necessity of instituting electoral reforms, especially in the area of uh, party switching or turncoatism. The old constitution, the 1971 constitution, Your Honours, provided a specific no-switch rule, quote-unquote, for candidates. If you remember, our constitution provided that no candidate for any elective public office, I'm referring to the 1971 constitution, may change his political party within six months, immediately preceding or following an election. Unfortunately, the 1987 Constitution removed this prohibition. However, our party believes that compelling state and public interest requires Congress to reinstate this by way of statutes to protect the integrity of all political parties and memberships therein. So far as the party and campaign finance proposals are concerned, uh, Your Honors, we are, our party is fully in accord with it, but uh, I would like to dwell specifically on the provisions related to turncoatism. We read the three bills, uh, Your Honors, but we noticed that the proposed bills, that under the proposed bills, the no switch rule, if I may be permitted to use that term, would apply only six months prior to an election prior to an election. We would like to respectfully ask that the rule should apply as well after an election, as originally espoused in the uh, old constitution. And may we hear we, more? We, may we hear more why you we, are proposing and we would like that to additional? Advance, yes, we would like to advance the following reason. First, this would prevent a winning candidate from altering his political party for opportunistic reasons. This is so true after every presidential elections. With the party in power having monopoly of privileges, funds, and patronage, it becomes a matter of political self-preservation, if not a desire to share in the spoils of the office, that a candidate almost always changes party allegiance after elections. Secondly, Providing a no-switch rule following an election is a good piece of anti-raiding legislation, if I may use that term, uh, Your Honours, anti-raiding legislation. There is a need to protect a political party from unwanted intrusion by other political parties, especially the dominant parties after a presidential election. And the way to achieve that is to apply the no-switch rule after elections, even for a limited uh, time. The other item that we would like to uh, uh, highlight, Your Honor, is this. We noticed that the durational period against turncoatism is only six months. It's only six months. Uh, similar to the provision of the 1971, which we think is rather arbitrary. We would like to respectfully suggest that the time frame be broadened to one year for the following reasons. We think that six months is rather short and will only have a minimal deterrent on party switching. The longer the period is, or the farther removed it is from an election, 
we believe that the interest of a candidate to switch parties become weaker. Secondly, a longer prohibitory period to switch parties would effectively eliminate or drastically reduce last minute self-serving decisions regarding candidacy. I think the committee would agree with me if I say that the dynamics of a particular race are almost never clear one year in advance of election. And then finally, the efficacy of the party system, we think, would be seriously impaired where members of one party could so easily disaffiliate and join another party after election. I am sure as members of political parties that many times a candidate with very good potential seek the support of the party. They come to us and say, you know, we would like to run under your party. We look at his bona fides and his credentials and we feel that he has very good potentials. But the notion of, uh, the notion that crosses the minds of party leaders is this. Kapag nanalo itong kandidato, baka iwanan naman tayo. In other words, because candidates elected could just leave the party, the party has no incentive to put forth a candidate that its leaders deem satisfactory. In short, the common conversation is, pababayaan naman tayo yan pagkatapos ng election. So in the end, the chief loser is the public. So for the following, for those foregoing reasons, uh, Madam Chair, we respectfully urge that uh, first, uh, the no switch rule apply after an election or following an election, and second, that the durational period of six months be broadened to uh, one year. Having said that, uh, Madam Chair, we believe that, our party believe that much of a constructive nature will be accomplished by the three bills towards restoring belief in our political system. And in behalf of the NPC, I would like to thank the sponsors and the committee for making this possible. Thank you very much, Yana. Thank you very much. Those are very interesting proposals, interesting views. Two points, extend six months to one year. That's the pre-election prohibition. And then apply the prohibition even after elections. But as you mentioned, it's got to be time bound also. There's got to be limit also. What do you think is a reasonable limitation for the post-election prohibition against uh, switching? Well, uh, it would of course be arbitrary, uh, Your Honor, but uh, if, we, if the committee agrees on a one year uh, prohibition before an election, then I suppose the logical period would be one year after the elections as well. Okay. Purely arbitrary. One Your year Honor. before and one year after? after. And uh, could be there would still be some room for switching after the uh, one year. That leaves only one. We have a three-year cycle, three-year election cycle. We, we, we uh, so I would have to ask uh, the authors about uh, what's their take on the proposal. Uh, Senator Drillon, um, is that I, acceptable? I join, I join uh, my good friend Gigi here in that adv advocacy that the prohibition on turncotism should also be present within a period of one year after the election. Because let's face it, the reality in our political scenario today, eh kung sino po ang nasa Malacanang, lahat na pupunta. <laughs> kung ano ang partido ang nakaupo sa Malacanang, ah, after the election, eh lahat siya nandun na. Now, I agree. Let us, let us prohibit, let us extend that period, not only one year before the election, but also one year after the election, so that those, ter those who would feel strongly that they have to change parties, they have one year to do so uh, uh, during the three-year term. So we endorse that proposal of uh, G.J. Agabo. The you. chair supports also that proposal. You have an additional comment, Attorney uh, Lara Zabal, former Commissioner. Greg. Good morning, Chairman. Um, what Congressman Gigi Agabao said was correct, Your Honor. If you have a six-month 
prohibition before elections, that is about the time where you file your COC. So it does not provide the political parties enough leeway to ensure a system of vetting candidates for the po different political positions. Because the filing now, because we're automated elections, it's about six months before elections. It's October. So at that time, it would be too late already because you need to vet candidates. So that's the one year. If you provide also a one-year ban after the elections, it will also allow polit individuals, political parties, organizations to check their databases. Because if you go to COMELEC after elections and check on the list of winning candidates, chances are those candidates will have already changed political party affiliations. And if that happens, your database in determining um, number of candidates one will not be accurate as not will not be as accurate it should be. May I suggest, your honors, if the the particular bills will be passed, it the Senate should also look at Section two six one of the Omnibus Election Code, which deals on the penalties. Um, Enumeration. Yes. That's the yes. list of the yes, election offences. Yes, your honor. Um, maybe. The, the particular uh, prohibitions, for example, turn cotism, may be incorporated or may amend particular section, paragraphs of that section. Your Honor, um, we've noticed before that uh, in the Philippines, there's a, it's politics of convenience. Um, individuals join a political party um, because of its convenient. Um, by having a prohibition jumping from one jumping from one party to another, that would provide more stability and the opportunity for political parties to grow because many politicians or candidates will now have to stick with a political party. So since you are proposing that we consider also including an amendment into the uh, list of the election offenses, Article 261. Yes, Although if we, if we put it in the law, then that would be a mandatory to yes. that particular provision because we, in fact, are adding to that list. So are you saying that you're in favor of criminalization or imposing criminal penalties on top of administrative penalties? I think the committee... Okay. I think the committee should look at that, Your Honor. Um, so what is what is the position of the NPC? Criminalization. Not, oh, not because if you are proposing to include it in the list of the election offenses, and you very well know that there are penalties. Yes, Your Honor. My, including my, imprisonment. Yes, and, my, or fine. My my specific my specific statement, Your Honor, was for the committee to look at how it will impact the the penalties in or prohibited acts stated in Section 261, um, because in, in electoral practice, Your Honor, as, as per experience, um, there are so many laws that, that will not, that just take, that focus on specific areas, but not have a holistic approach into improving the electoral system, Your Honor. So it's just a suggestion that it have a look at. Thank you. May we hear from Bayan Muna, Attorney Neri. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you for Senator Drillon. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Unfortunately, my staff relayed the invitation yesterday, so I was not able to prepare a written uh, comment on the bills. So I, I will confine myself for now for on general uh, comments on the uh, thrust, policy thrust of the bills and the implementation procedures, trying to recall the debates which happened in the House of Representatives during the passage of the bills uh, in, in the House. So uh, firstly, Madam Chair, Your Honors, please. Uh, this is, these are very important uh, electoral reform initiatives, and we really <laughs> consider that. For example, Madam Chair, campaign contribution regulations, very important. Money politics had 
a large or insidious impact already on our electoral uh, system and therefore I think campaign regulation uh, must be given stringent uh, teeth for that matter, uh, Madam Chair. Secondly, the provisions on imposing transparency regulations, very important. Uh, re registering bank accounts where donors can condonate, very, very good initiative because uh, that will help uh, strengthen transparency, Your Honor, please. Sal end of political parties, good, very good, and the reporting procedures. Thirdly, turncoatism. Turncoatism, in fact, I have this very similar proposal here. Uh, Kay Gigi, no, uh, Congressman Agabao, uh, one year before and one year after. No? Kasi, uh, as mentioned kanina, and I will not go into that anymore. Although hindi namin problema ang turncoatism sa bayan muna, uh, ganun ang nangyayari. Uh, pag sino ang presidente, ang uh, mga ang politiko ay normally lilipat doon sa partido ng presidente. Kami naman baliktad, uh, kung sino ang presidente na sa oposisyon kami normally. <laughs> <laughs> Checks and balance po kami. So, these are, pero ang pag-strengthen ng political parties, this is very good initiative. Uh, kailangan ma-strengthen. Kaya sa mga party list kasi, very important yung strengthening of political parties. But my take on that is, hanggat may, walang anti-dynasty law, Mr. Chair, your Honor, Madam Chair, Your Honors. Baliwala yan. When candidates win in elections... Yun po ang susunod natin yung anti-political yes. dynasty bills. Thank you for Good. For. I was the author of that in the House of Representatives. Very one last Congress, and uh, I was the main author, in fact, I was the one who filed it, but uh, it foundered in the House. So, sa akin, uh, if candidates win elections because of their dynastic connections, their family names, they're not beholden to political parties. Political parties are just mere mechanisms for them. So, very important din yun. So, uh, these are good uh, electoral reform initiatives, in, especially in the context na napaka-difficult ng uh, democratizing electoral processes in the Philippines, by poverty tayo, electoral fraud, uh, money politics, may difficulty ang COMELEC in monitoring and uh, providing rules for certain conditions. So for example, I'd like to, to, to cite donations, crowdsourcing, very important for small parties like Bayhan Muna, mga internet donations na mga maliliit na donors. But Apparently, kailangan pa mag-device ng COMELEC on, on things like this. Kasi, you, you know, you, these are thousands and thousands. Yung tulad ng bangkit mo kanina, Mr. Yeah. Madam Chair, yung kami nagpa-fundraising, kami lugawan para sa bayan muna. And these are thousands of people coming, donating 50 pesos. How, how, do, you, how do you do that, di ba? So, kasi sa don, donation procedures, may mga ano ka, may mga pipirma. Hindi na mga pipirma, yung bigay ka lang 50 pesos. You go through the length. So, and the rules, of course, on in-kind donations and what constitutes campaign uh, propaganda. Kailangan mag-adjust ng COMELEC doon. For example, I like to put in an issue. I wrote to COMELEC once. Itong ACS, ito siyang may mga advertising siya, pride, detergent. Sabi niya sa election campaign, dapat bumoto kayo ng mabuti. Pero may isang kandidato dyan, mamamatay tao. May isang kandidato dyan, kurakot. May isang kandidato dyan, hindi naman Pilipino. So I asked Komi, like, oh, anong, saan nyo ito ibibilang? Is this a donation for a candidate? This was referring to certain presidential candidates. Apparently, hindi pa equipped ang rules to deal with uh, these kinds of in-kind donations or what constitutes a political propaganda. So very good initiatives ito. Now, I'd like to share some issues na lang sa bills, Your Honor, that plagued the House and caused it to founder in the House also during the debates. Not all the issues, some. Ang unang issue doon dati, Madam Chair, is the failure of the bills in the House to assuage the continued existence of the party list groups. In fact, many of the bills uh, or hindi ma-assure ang party list uh, representatives sa House na, na andun sila sa scheme of things ng development, uh, political uh, development, party development act. So, yun yung source ng opposition. One of the rare moments when the party list groups united. Eh. Malakas yun. Second, failure to devise ng bills noon, ng issue yan noon. To yung e equality ba yung benefits? Kasi kung ang standards mo, number of mayors, number of... Siyempre, ang party list, wala ka talagang masyadong mayor, wala kang... So, sa benefits ng state subsidy, 
naghanap ng means na may procedure na ma-assuage din yun. So, those are the issues with regards party list. Second point, donations. Uh, Siyempre, as a small candidate, siguro baka sabihin ng iba may bias ka, gusto mo maliit lang yung campaign ano, contribution cap. Um, 5 pesos to 20 pesos. From 250 million pesos to about 1 billion ba? 1 billion. So, ang initial na ano ko dyan, medyo mataas. Dito kami medyo hindi magkapareho ni Chair. Masyadong mataas para sa... Anyway, basta stringent lang naman ang monitoring ng Comilex sa cap ng campaign contribution. Eh kung 250 million yan o 500 million, let the candidates debate in public rather than paligsahan sila ng donations at advertise ka lang advertise. Do not... 800,000 for 30 seconds of, uh, of uh, advertising nung senatorial, you know, pero so mag-adjust naman yung mga TV stations pag alam nila hanggang dito lang yung cup eh. So for me, med medyo malaki yung uh, 1 billion peso per, per candidate. Tapos syempre yung sinabi ko kanina, yung in-kind regulation. Tapos yung uh, sa corporate donors naman, May mga studies dyan, uh, in fact, may dearth of studies on the empirical impact of allowing corporate donors. In the Philippine context, sa ibang bansa kasi, the corporate donors could be the corporations, the trade unions. Sa Pilipinas, mostly corporations yan. We haven't reached the stage yet na may mga NGOs o na naglalabi with enough money to really fund. No? So, isang issue yan na dapat uh, tingnan. Pero, Sa akin, sige, ang donors, pwede mong hayaan, pero dapat may, for me, initial ko lang, initial lang ito. Ah. Dapat may rule na kung donor ka, you must have no contact at all with your donee during the term of your donee on any issue related to your interest. Kung magkocontact ka man sa iyong donee, you must declare it sa COMELEC as a lobbying ano, exercise. Oh, I'm going to contact a certain congressman, a certain senator, kasi gusto ko babaan ng tax sa ganito, sa aming, you know, you declare it. Otherwise, para sa akin, ang hindi ako ganun ka gangho doon sa mga corporate donors. Uh, now we go to state subsidy. This is my last point. Ang issues na na-raise noon sa House, syempre, the usual discussions, kulang ka nga ng pera sa social services. If a fund mo, mayayamang political parties from taxpayers' money. So, parang medyo hindi siya palatable sa maraming uh, groups and sectors. May budget deficit ka pa, etc. Pangalawa, uh, sa bills noon, and I hope the TWG will also settle this, walang formula for the, do for the state subsidy fund. So, gano'ng kalaki yan? Is it going to be how many billions? Uh, it must be resolved kasi ang studies around the world on this issue is that incumbent subsidize. Ibig sabihin, ang magde-decide kung magkano ang state subsidy are the incumbents. So, dapat i-formula mo yan. Otherwise, ang incumbents, they will load it in, the f in favor of their political parties. So, that's the second. Yung formula sana na para hindi naman na strictly hindi makaalagwa ang mga incumbents na lakihan ng state subsidy, especially sa party nila. Pangatlo, sa tax. Actually, ang initial comment ko po sa tax, bakit exempted siya from, from donor's tax sa akin? Da dapat nga i-tax eh. Ang tax normally is inflationary. Normally. Pero dito... Sa akin, hindi eh. Hindi siya kasi eh. So, sa akin, yung, yung tax, parang isabihin ng mga sectors, ang systems loss na binabayaran namin sa kuryente, may VAT. Systems loss na yan sa kuryente, binabat kami ng gobyerno to raise funds. Eh, ito. Bakit hindi i-exempt ito sa tax, di ba? And so, um, and pang pangapat, yung inflation index increase, sigurado ko may magre-raise ng issue dyan. Parang automatic ang increase ng state subsidy sa political parties. Sabihin ng iba, kami sa SSS, ilang beses ko na pinropose na uh, inflation index ang pension increase. Uh, hindi talaga ma-approve-approve yan. Pero dito sa political parties, 
you know, while SSS pensioners have to grovel before Congress or the President to increase their pension, eh, ito, automatic, umi-increase eh. Kasi inflation index siya. So, those are the comments uh, I have as a general rule on the bill, subject to my written comments uh, as soon as possible, Your Honors, please. Ang conclusion ko na lang, yes, there is there, there's a need for electoral reforms and the political development party well, political party development act is a good you no know, is a good initiative for electoral reform this is a second generation right ah sorry this is a second generation electoral reform policy kaya siya tinatawag na second generation in li the literature sa studies na ito kasi may first generation electoral reform policies ito yung basic reforms dynasty electoral fraud union so Maganda naman siyang initiative, pero siyempre, hanggat hindi mo na-achieve fully ang first generation electoral reforms, may problemang malaki yung second generation, or uh, at least ang impact niya hindi ganun kalaki. The second point I'd like to raise is, there, was this, this, there is this concept, I think Torres Rivas is the, one of the main uh, ano, tawag, the acad academes dito. Ang tawag niya dito, sa mga proposals na ito, assumptions of modernities. Ang ibig sabihin ni Torres Rivas dyan, pag may proposal ka ng ganito, there is an assumption na modern ang society. May capacity ang commission and election to monitor, to regulate, tapos yung poverty levels. So, minsan, nagpa-founder na rin doon yung mga electoral reforms kasi hindi siya fit pa. Ang ibig lang sabihin, magandang initiative but the time has not yet come. So those are the issues na ni-raise noon sa House. No? So um, na, na, may assumptions of modernities na sinasabi. So, but, so basically, may pinanggit ako kanina na good points ng bills and I hope they should be uh, encouraged. Itong issues naman na ni-raise ko, I hope they should be resolved during the TWG hearings or other hearings in the processing of the bills. But these are very good electoral reform initiatives, Your Honor, and I will submit a written uh, comment uh, as soon as possible, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Well, with due respect, uh, so far as this particular issue is concerned, this particular desired reform, which is political party reform and development is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's actually overdue. The time is now to really push it. We all aspire for more reforms in our electoral system. We all aspire for as much as you know, ex uh, all of the expanded and all additional uh, inputs into the, uh, our electoral system. So we can start by gradually introducing all this. And the political party development is, is, is one of... Uh, Just a clarification, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. In fact, I quote my statement na ito yung mga issues na magandang ma-resolve before the... Uh, yes, we, yeah. we, we take that into so, consideration. The TWG will uh, be glad to uh, further uh, deliberate on those very good issues. Uh, is, that, is that in point, Commissioner Guanzon? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I received a text from Commissioner Louis Guia, may yes. I? Yes. Uh, so that he can uh, also uh, uh, be on record as having participated. Uh, uh, and I agree with him that it is a uh, COMELEC in the end that has to be equipped financially and organizationally to monitor uh, uh, campaign uh, finance uh, issues and the registration of political parties. So we, he, Commissioner Guia is suggesting that we, uh, the, the law can be strengthened to enable the COMELEC to perform by, by those functions. By also further empowering and yes. enabling Yes, COMELEC. because uh, right mm -hmm. now, Chair, uh, we don't have a strong campaign finance unit because uh, we had to apply for, for the organization, yes. the Plantilla, yes. with the DBM, and it's still yes. under process. Uh, right now, our campaign finance unit is uh, uh, organization-wise uh, under the supervision of the chair, but with uh, a designated, uh, uh, you know, acting 
uh, yes. officer in charge there. Uh, the other thing is that you, the Commissioner Guia is suggesting that uh, the the law on uh, the Fair Election Act may be amended uh, together with, the, uh, of course, as a consequence of the uh, the bills that we are uh, discussing and on subsidy. Uh, uh, that there are actually some countries where the, he says that based on his research, there are actually some countries which do not allow individual um, expenditures for campaign so that the uh, uh, campaign finance is really regulated and then it equalizes the opportunities for elections. So, Maybe uh, the, thank you. those that the, the time is not yet. Yes, ma'am. Right. But may I just comment on the... Uh, Madam Chair, can we give our other resource yeah, persons yes. an uh, opportunity yes, also uh, to speak? Uh, Otherwise, yes. we, thank can, you, Senator. We, we can have the other comments afterwards. Yes. May, uh, thank you, thank you Chair. Right. We will submit our written uh, We will appreciate that. Yeah. Let's, yes. let's focus on the political party development uh, measures. Uh, can we recognize PDP Laban? Uh, Again, please good focus morning. on the three matters that yes, I asked. Morning, any Chair. reservation, any opposition, uh, any different or, or, or opposing view? Yeah, we mostly agree with the opinions of the resource persons yes. uh, with regards to turncoatism, campaign financing, and government subsidy. Uh, at this point, we have not submitted the position paper. Louder, at this please. point, uh, Madam Chair, we have not submitted our position paper, and uh, rest assured, uh, in the next few days, uh, we'll be given the opportunity to submit our papers uh, in consultation with other uh, committee members. Thank you. We intend to conduct a TWG here on February 2. So if you can have written position papers before February 2. Uh, Una? Just before that. Uh, yes, in yes, relation yes. to the TWG, a very technical aspect. I would suggest this is a shortcoming on the bills. We have penalties, uh, imprisonment, etc. Uh, it, it's a general statement, violation of this law in, uh, uh, will, will result in penalties. May I suggest that the technical working group specify which acts are unlawful? And it is only in those instances where the penalty will apply. For example, turncoatism is a prohibited act. But as pointed out by Attorney Agabao, it, it should not be, uh, it should not result in a criminal prosecution, only an administrative uh, uh, matter. So it is, so we should, if, if the technical working group can work on that, then we should specify which provisions of the law or which acts are considered unlawful and therefore subject to the criminal prosecution. Because not everything here uh, should, should, should uh, uh, entail the criminal prosecution, but the way I have crafted my bill, it simply says any candidate or official of the National Political Party who violates any provision of this act shall be punished with imprisonment. So. It's general, so put it where this, where, where, which are unlawful acts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, NTWG must take note of that. Uh, Una? Hi, good morning, Your Honors. Yeah, we actually just received the uh, invitation yesterday. So, uh, as of uh, the meantime, we would actually like to reserve our comments uh, until and unless uh, we get to talk with the team and uh, discuss uh, the proper uh, suggestions to make. Uh, but uh, th we thank you for actually inviting us here, Your Honor. Can, can we get the written uh, the written position paper before February two? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Your Honors. If ever we do and especially on those three it. three issues. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. If Next would decide. be uh, other political parties here. Mm. Ako Bicol, Ms. Santos. Marjaina Aga po, ma'am. Marjaina Aga, <laughs> Chief of Staff. Okay. Do you, have Aga, a do you have a written position paper? Actually, uh, we received this week the invitation. So, um, we, uh, Congressman Batokabe, Ko, and Kerbin uh, would like to uh, study it further. 
But so far, with the three uh, issues, issues, turncoatism, state subsidy, and uh, limits on voluntary contribution, so far there are no, uh, there have been no issue yet. But uh, we would like to uh, study it further, and then we will forward the written copy. Okay, we expect that before February too. Thank you very much. So we go to uh, uh, Mon Casiple. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we don't have a written position yet on these bills, but we have submitted uh, position papers since 2002 on this particular bill, and I'm getting tired of, <laughs> of you know, submitting right? position <laughs> papers. <laughs> so I would like uh, to focus my my comments. Uh, we will, we will submit a, a position paper after we read this uh, particular bills. But uh, my, my own position, and also that of my institute, uh, is that uh, this particular bill is a very important bill, uh, which is actually a fundamental type of a bill, because it sets forth the framework for further democratization of uh, our country. And uh, we understood that uh, many of the problems of the political system actually is related to this particular bill, yeah. like uh, the question of dynasties. Uh, dynasties have substituted for political party system through the years, and it is time to bring back the uh, focus of our political uh, 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 That's why we're tackling both uh, almost simultaneously. Yes, uh, we know uh, that, and we support both the uh, bills and, uh, and the political uh, anti-political anti dynasty, dynasty bill and this one. But uh, I would like to stress the importance, particularly in the light of uh, the present situation uh, and the issues. For example, we have uh, climate change as a major global issue now. But most uh, solutions or approaches to climate change requires long-term planning, even 50 years or 100 year type of planning. No candidate or individual politician can, can do that. Only an organization can do the long-term planning. In fact, it's already a recognized principle in their papers in the UN that stress the strengthening of political party system as part of the approaches that needs to be done. Because political parties, of course, can have this long-term planning. Second, uh, in the light, of course, of uh, the uh, political events in our country, uh, whenever a presidential uh, election comes and a certain presidential candidate uh, wins, it's almost automatic that his or her party becomes the ruling party, even if there's only one, two, or three who are members before the elections. And the rest of the parties are relegated to opposition and basically a skeleton. Uh, we would like to avoid that, and I support uh, Congressman Agabao when he says that uh, turncoatism as a particular manifestation of that weakness should be actually handled very strictly. And uh, we take as our model the, the bill that was passed its third reading in the 15th Congress by the House of Representatives, which is also the, almost the same as the committee report of that particular Congress. And uh, I would like to specifically feel, uh, focus on the one year. Uh, I, be Maybe before and after? Uh, well, that was part actually of our proposals then in the both houses during the 15th Congress. And the reason for that one, that, that was not mentioned, uh, is that uh, it's easier to do it because there's already a precedent. And this is the removal of officials. You can, you can only have a recall uh, one year after, one year before. So that's the second year of a three-year term. So it's easy to, to explain the, but uh, of course the real reason there is that y you need to have time to for that particular candidate to pay back his party. That's the one year after 
the, 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 the party supported him, campaigned for him, uh, also spent money on him. So you cannot just leave your party after you win. And then, of course, before a, an election, uh, tactical consideration would come in if it's too short a time. And uh, one year before an election is a, a good time, actually, when there's no certainty yet on how the alignments would uh, appear. My second point, uh, actually, is with regards to the subsidy. Uh, there are two schools of thought that came out during the whole period of this uh, uh, bill. One school of thought says that you should strengthen the strong parties. You should, to, to have an effective political party system, you don't need 100 plus parties. In fact, that would weaken the whole system. You need to have a functional number of parties that can effectively uh, establish a political base, a credible political base, so that... On that point, um, let it be clear that what I see in this bill is that it's not really proposing a monopoly of political parties or a return to the two political party system is just really to strengthen political parties and in so doing i agree of course that uh, only a number we don't we don't we don't uh uh anticipate or we don't want numerous political parties and and we we can we can strengthen a number of these political parties, but we are not really batting for a monopoly or a return to the two political party system. That is that, correct. That's uh, also to be uh, clear. It's correct, Madam Chair. Uh, we are not for uh, two political party, but we are also not for too many parties. Both would weaken the political party system. So we need to be precise or be clear on the criteria. And uh, one of the uh, argumentations actually that was mentioned by Congressman Colmenares was on the role of the political, of the party list groups. Because the essence of the, the, the party list system before was supposed to be on the, a training ground. That was the concept before during the uh, Constitutional Commission. That's why it was limited to 20%. It, it was basically an experiment there. But the intent is to ensure that the door is open for marginalized and underrepresented sectors. But the idea is that they will not remain marginalized and underrepresented. They have to strengthen. That's why the Partners Act, that's the law for them, is supposed to do that to prepare them to enter the regular elections and become real political parties. Okay. Bayan and Bayan Muna. How about Bayan state subsidy? How about state subsidy? What's the position of your organization? Oh, we definitely support that because it goes along with the principle of political parties as public institutions. In many countries, it's already an accepted fact that democracy cannot strengthen itself, cannot work without strong political parties. That's why the state needs to provide the funds precisely to ensure that vested interest and other partisan interests cannot control the party. And uh, therefore, you need to have this uh, minimum level. This is not the entire expenditures of a party. But you need a minimum level of funds for that party to function on a year-round basis, not only because of elections but in order to function as a normal representation of their own constituency. Yes, and I think the financing here, the idea of financing and subsidizing political parties is not limited to election period, but really the, every year it's annual financing, yeah. only that the sharing would increase when it becomes, when it's uh, election period. Okay, so we will just check out your previous written <laughs> uh, submissions for consideration. Uh, PP Sarvi, IBP. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Duran. 
uh, the PPCRB and the IBP thanks you for inviting these organizations to this committee hearing which is very important in our electoral reforms. PPRs, PPCRB supports the strengthening of political parties. However, we were not able to write a position paper at this time because the chairman is in Rome uh, with the peace talks. And the uh, IBP just received the invitation last Monday. But uh, rest assured, Madam Chair, that we will see... Do you intend to submit a written position, written position paper position again paper before February, before February 2, February please? Two. And you're welcome. Everyone actually is welcome uh, uh, in the TWG level. Yes, uh, at, um, Attorney Lara Zabal? Ma'am, just a quick point regarding the, the filing of the Certificate of Nominations and Acceptance. Mm. Um, in the proposed Order. bill the political parties are limited to only the number of candidates uh, in available position. We did notice that in previous elections, some candidates ask CONAS from not one, but multiple parties. Um, it appears in the bill that the CONAS should be submitted to... I isn't that a ground, the submission of multiple CONAS? Isn't, isn't that a ground of, of declaring uh, that, that particular candidate as an independent candidate rather than a Except candidate for a political party? Your Honor, that is correct. Mm. Okay, but what, what candidates do, they only submit one. So may I suggest, Your Honor, that the political parties, five days after the deadline for the filing of COC and CONA, have to submit a list to Comlec, for Comlec main, um, for Comlec to be able to determine if a particular candidate has been given one or multiple CONAS. If a candidate has been issued and the CONA has been accepted, that may be a ground to declare him an independent candidate, Your Honor. So your suggestion is to, in fact, include a provision on yes. that in this Yes, Your Honor. this particular measure, I yes, don't think there's, it's a problem. We can always consider that. Yes, sir. It has but multiple uh, objectives. Yes, ma'am. Anyway. Mm -hmm. it, yes, sorry. And it's very much related. It's germane to the issue because we're talking here about membership also in political parties. So uh, that would help uh, the COMELEC in its monitoring functions. Exactly, okay. ma'am. Um, but the political parties should be required to submit to COMLEC within five days after the deadline of filing of COCs, mm -hmm. a complete, complete list of the individuals who they issued CONAS to. Why five days? Because mm -hmm. in some positions, elected positions, for example, mayor, councillors, it is not only it is not the main office or the secretariat who, of secretary general, the president of the party that signs the CONA, but authorized representatives of the SECGEN or the president either the governor or congressman who signs the CONA. So five days will allow the political parties to submit and consolidate reports to submit it to Comrade okay. Garner. That will be considered. Let's consider that as among the miscellaneous provisions of all the bill. Let's go to the other groups. Uh, Con Conrad? First of all, Senator. Madam Chairman, um, thank you very much. We are, uh, or I personally am very honored to be invited as a foreigner. And uh, just like Mon Casipo, we've been uh, writing Submitting. position papers <laughs> since 1964, actually. So <laughs> um, okay. I do believe, and Konrad Adenauer Stiftung believes, that in a vibrant democracy, uh, political parties are the backbone of that democracy and civic participation in that democracy. Therefore, I believe that all of those acts, if enacted, would improve the situation immediately already. Uh, nonetheless, along those three lines that you have mentioned, Madam Chairwoman, um, I have comments. For the part of turncoatism, I've been thinking about this for years, and I really wish that the political culture and the electorate would uh, regulate and, and punish uh, turncoatism uh, themselves, but however, I feel that this is not possible. In addition to the consequences of turncoatism that are highlighted in the acts... You can still punish. 
Yeah. Only that it's not criminal. <laughs> yes. Administrative penalties is, are, are penalties. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I meant uh, the electorate would punish turncotism mm -hmm. by not uh, favoring that candidate anymore in the future, I meant to say. But um, anyways, uh, mm -hmm. the provision I would uh, suggest to add is that turncoats who no longer mm -hmm. represent the party they ran for shall be punished even if it's less than six months prior to the coming elections by losing their seat in all committees they are members of. Even though, um, as it is provided in the acts, that turncotism uh, is free from the previously mentioned punishment six months before um, elections, uh, they should, yes, or one year, um, they should nonetheless lose their seats in the committees to prevent them from exercising turncoatism excessively and randomly. For the part of campaign finance, I fully agree with the dear chair of Comelec, and I think it is very important to make clear that there is a rationale for donations from corporations also and uh, private sector donations and donations from individuals. However, I fully agree that the caps and limits of that have to reflect current realities, as it is not the case right now in terms of campaign finance. Nonetheless, I may add that corporate donations, it should include in the law, corporate donations must not be linked to any political favors or conditions, and corporations that donate must not ask specifically for such favors. In reality, that is hard to implement, but still, uh, to have the legal basis for sanctions, the law should include that. Then, for the part of the state fund, state subsidy fund, or the party fund, I believe that is actually the most important part of the acts provided here because I fully agree with Monka Siebler that political parties are public institutions and if there is no regulating state fund that can provide them with the capacities to actually run as institutions or organizations, they are prone to elite capture. In order to perform their function as vehicles for civic participation in political decision making, they have to be independent from just individual donors or elite capture, and a state fund or a state subsidy can provide that opportunity. Nonetheless, as uh, Comelec mentioned earlier, uh, there have to be precautions to make sure that not everybody registers a party and wants to have money from the state in that case. Therefore, I'm suggesting that... Registration, of course, would be yes, mandatory. Yes, registration, yeah. In fact, the, the Therefore, uh, I'm suggesting that... the current laws, it's mandatory. The amounts being paid from the state subsidy fund must not exceed donations plus membership dues of those parties. So again, can you state that again? The, money that a political mm -hmm. party shall receive from that fund, uh -huh. that state fund, must not exceed the equivalent amount the party is receiving from membership dues and donations. Okay, so you are, you, are, you are seeking to limit the yes. amount. And the rationale, and is, the rationale is? The rationale is that mm -hmm. this ensures that the party actually exists and provides membership and ownership of its members that are paying dues and this would prove that the party actually operates as a party Good with two paying members. Otherwise, mm -hmm. um, let's say playing uh, the devil's advocate, one could try to uh, just have any kind of civil society organization yes. run as a political party. Yeah. TWG to consider that. Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Yeah. Also, parties shall account for their internal democratic processes. This is in line with what I just uh -huh, said. Uh -huh. 
and submit documents of elections of officials and national and local conventions in line with their own constitution and bylaws, which they also would have to present to make sure that they are genuine political, programmatic, democratic political parties that are entitled to that party fund. That's my comments for those three lines. And furthermore, uh, although this is not strictly related to those acts here, I'm suggesting that in order to create more cohesion among political parties and prevent turncoatism, I'm suggesting that both the House of Representatives and the Senate shall enable the formation of real parliamentary party groups within both houses and therefore provide a fund that can operate the organization of parliamentary groups for political parties that have more than, say, three members in either house. That would, uh, as far as I'm... We'll further it, study that. Yes. Uh, uh, I would I would request a position paper of that, mm -hmm. even at, as I note that you have been previously submitting position papers mm -hmm. also. But on that particular point, can we have can we have a written yes. uh, paper on that? So that's it. Yeah, Thank you very much. Next would be Lente. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning. Lente. Uh, Lente's first uh, comment is with respect to the state subsidy uh, because uh, it appears that based on section 18 and 20 of the house bills uh, the the basis for the release of state subsidy will be the number of positions that yes, uh, yes no but yes. Uh, in that case that will only support the existing uh, uh, dynastic uh, uh, inclination, or you will only be supporting the those uh, parties with the uh, whose uh, uh, candidates are into power. No? So, uh, Lente's idea of this uh, House bill is that it should support the development of uh, new parties, no? not existing parties. No? Mm -hmm. So, I, I uh, we believe that the the TWG should revisit Section 18 and 20. So that particular criterion would be discriminatory yes, to again, smaller parties yes, and no, to new parties, which yeah. could be more serious yes, no. in, in their advocacies yes. rather than the big, the big ones. Yes. Okay. Uh, secondly, ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, we could incentivize the release of the state subsidy fund no? based on, for example, whether the, the party, the accredited party, actually performs activities uh, based on their principles and ideology. So, uh, uh, th obviously the parties, the accredited national parties will submit report reportorial requirements and th perhaps the, the COMELEC can, can review those, uh, those documents and actually determine if uh, uh, those activities are in line with the, with the party's uh, ideology. You know? And thirdly, um, uh, in, in the process of in incentivizing, uh, I think it is important that we put uh, uh, that I think it is important we that we uh, prioritize uh, activities which actually uh, develop linkages as social societal linkages, no? Uh -huh. Because uh, in the in and under the existing regime, no. Uh, the, the the political regime is uh, mostly what those those people in, into power are, are members of the elites, no? Mo as a general rule, and they are uh, they have a disconnect really from the people in in the grassroots. in the grassroots, no? So if we if we prioritize the activities which uh, develop societal linkages, then this could I incidentally. Uh, could also address uh, the the problem of dynasties in the country. Thank you very much. Again, very valid points for consideration at the DWG level. Just uh, adding certain uh, provisions into the criteria and also the activities 
the authorized activities for political parties. Democracy Watch. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, for Democracy Watch, well, we have always believed um, on the uh, of politics of platform and uh, programs over politics of convenience. That's why we we share we share the view uh, exposed by the earlier resource persons that uh, we should also increase the the period of uh, the for candidates on, on political on political party switching to one year prior uh, prior to the date of the election as well as in fact I don't see or hear any objection from anyone here yes ma'am with respect to the proposal of <laughs> Congressman Gigi one year before one year, one after, year after I think that's yes, already consider it done is going and to be placed in the bill likewise the proposed legislations must be able to set up a clear legal framework and the corresponding implementing rules and regulations to prevent uh, loopholes in the political party system. Alongside this one is uh, the COMELEC should be more empowered uh, in its strict and efficient implementation and enforcement of its supervisory as well as regulatory measures concerning campaign expenditures as well as disclosure requirements. Uh, we would also would want to to propose, or we we likewise like the idea that the filing of statement of campaign expenditures to avail of fiscal incentives, tax deductions, or tax exemptions for individuals and corporate campaign contributions uh, to encourage uh, public disclosure. And at the same time, uh, we believe that transforming political parties into public institutions can be attained by promoting outward accountability or stakeholder control of parties recipients of this fund. Reforms should be, uh, reforms under the party development fund should transform political parties into more program oriented organizations, not rooted on personalities, but on clear cut policies of governance. Uh, we submitted a position paper with the, co with the Secretariat so as not to belabor the committee with that. Uh, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Who, who else? Uh, Ms. Guevara, you are representing? Ah, also Democracy Watch. So there's no one else. Um, as I announced, there will be a TWG discussions on this bills because we hope to really already submit the corresponding committee report. My, my target is later part of February or early part of, of March. I should be able to sponsor this already on the plenary so that plenary interpolations and debates can already start. As I said, I'm determined to really push for this, this Congress. So if we can make it at the first half of this Congress, the first three years in time perhaps for the 2009 elections or 2022 uh, elections, then uh, we have to do it. So whether or not there are written submissions from, from the uh, various resource organizations and speakers, we will push through with the TWG and the chair or the committee will, will await the recommendations from the TWG. I think it's just really a matter of coming up with the acceptable consolidated substitute bill incorporating all the uh, salient features of the three uh, measures. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And pahabo lang, on February 1 would be the anti-political dynasty. Para matay ka sa TWG on February, February 2. Thank you.